latest control uh, by focusing on latest achievements and challenges ahead. So my talk will be a little bit different from the rest of the talks in, uh, in this session. Um, uh, I would like to start with a short introduction. And this slide is just to remind you that rabies is caused by negative, negative strand RNA viruses in the genus Lyssa virus in the uh, Raptoviride family. Uh, there are 16 recognized and two putative uh, Lyssa virus species known to date. Um, with the classical rabies virus uh, as a prototype Lyssa virus species in the genus. Uh, the classical rabies virus is spread in a variety of animals um, uh, uh, across the world. In contrast, uh, the great majority of the remaining uh, Lyssa viruses exclusively occur in bats and therefore have a narrow geographic and host range distribution. So if we talk about terrestrial rabies caused by the classical rabies virus, we are confronted with a large variety of reservoir species. Uh, apart from uh, um, bats uh, in the Americas, uh, rather our species for the classical rabies virus exclusively reside in the order Carnivora, and here dogs are the main problem. So dog-mediated uh, dog rabies uh, is a major public health problem. 99% of all human rabies cases worldwide result from dog bites. And recently, WHO estimated that still about 60,000 people on average die every year of the disease, with the heaviest incidence of human casualties falling on Africa and Asia. So actually, that clearly tells you that uh, rabies is still a neglected disease at the beginning of the 21st century. And the strategy actually, actually is that we do have all the tools available for preventing uh, human rabies and even to eliminate canine rabies worldwide. And in order to stop that tra uh, tragedy, uh, the three international organizations, WHO, OIE, and FAO, joined five years ago their efforts uh, in a tripartite, and together with the Global Alli uh, Alliance for Rabies Control, uh, we're forming a coalition uh, uh, known under the term um, uh, United Against Rabies uh, Collaboration to end human death from dogmedated rabies by 2030. That is for sure a very ambitious goal, but we have to start somehow. With, the tra uh, with wildlife rabies, <laughs> it's a little bit of a different story. Wildlife mediated rabies mainly occurs in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so there is um, growing evidence that um, um, rabies can also be maintained in wildlife in other parts of the world. However, as you can see here, the level of surveillance in most of the uh, world is uh, still inadequate. In principle, you can uh, vaccinate wildlife reservoir species as any other animal by the parenteral route using inactivated um, rabies virus vaccines, but you don't have to be a genius to realize <coughs> that it's impractical, you know, and th therefore no option. So in order to uh, create an immune barrier within these wildlife reservoir species to interrupt the infectious cycle and stop the transmission of the disease, the only solution to the problem is oral vaccination. And here we can rely on a number of uh, attenuated rabies virus vaccines. Uh, the great majority of them um, are uh, all derived from one uh, ancestor, as you can see here in that picture. And they are highly efficacious, uh, but depending on the, you know, whether they belong to the first, second, or a third generation, uh, um, are, um, show a slight difference uh, in terms of their safety profile uh, as far as residual pathogenicity is concerned. There are also recombinant vaccines <laughs> available, as you can see here in that slide, but unfortunately only two um, uh, recombinant vaccine virus constru constructs, a human adenovirus and the vaccine uh, 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 um, recombinant uh, construct, both expressing the rabies virus glycoprotein were brought to the market and licensed. So what are the latest achievements? Um, 
the elimination of fox rabies uh, in Europe is the preeminent pre example of a successful control of a zoonotic disease in, uh, in wildlife. So um, as you can see here, uh, using oral vaccination of foxes, we were able to eliminate uh, fox mediated rabies from large, large parts in uh, Western and Central Europe. This is the situation 40 years ago, and you see uh, what a difference uh, 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 today. So during the past 40 years, 30 European countries implemented oral vaccination uh, programs on their territories, and the coherent area ever vaccinated during this time period amounts to 2.7 million kilometers square. And depending on the number of campaigns conducted and the duration of the uh, vaccination programs, the cumulative area even amounts to four, uh, roughly 40 million kilometers square. And by 2018, 15 European countries gained uh, rabies-free status thanks to uh, ORE. And during that time point, uh, during this time period, m uh, roughly 740 million baits were distributed all over Europe. So there are also success stories in North America, but here, you know, that is more species dependent success. Uh, using oral vaccination, uh, our Canadian colleagues were able to eliminate Arctic variant rabies in red foxes from Ontario, and our American colleagues were even able to stop rabies episodics in coyotes and gray foxes in the United States and get rid of these rabies virus variants at the animal source. So mission accomplished, you can ask, uh, but what are the challenges ahead? And if we talk about challenges, we first have to look, you know, what are the pillars of oral rabies vaccination of wildlife? You have the vaccine strains on the one hand, vaccine baits, the, the, um, um, the, the baits play an important role. Then you have to have a bait, uh, an optimal bait delivery and a distribution system, and last but not least, uh, um, um, an optimal vaccination strategy, and that you know, in, in the context of the uh, wildlife reservoir host you are going to target. And these pillars per se are actually uh, the challenges. And within the next um, few minutes, I would like to give you some examples uh, um, what, uh, what the challenges are. So now that we have almost accomplished the mission of eliminating fox rabies in Europe, we need to make up our minds how to maintain freedom from disease in the future. And the idea is uh, to establish a vaccination belt along the common borders with our neighbors to the east. But the problem is as long uh, if, if our neighbors do not implement our vaccination campaigns on their territories, we would have to keep that vaccination belt for eternity. So that brings me to the question, uh, how do we continue, let's say, um, with um, our vaccination in the uh, eastern part of Europe? And that is, um, the problem is best illustrated if we move a vaccination, a vaccination area of any one year into the eastern part of the continent, as I, you know, uh, as I did with the ORV areas from 2013. While in this case here, the, let's say the, the, the efforts and costs for establishing this vaccination area were shared by a dozen of countries, this would have to be and in this case here, this uh, would have to be covered by a single country only, and we are just talking about one uh, particular campaign here. So, so what would be, uh, uh, so how, do, uh, what vaccination strategy to, to be applied in larger areas? And that does not only apply to Europe, but also to North America, considering the vast territories that are endemic with wildlife uh, rabies there. So it seems that the small-scale approach we have been using in uh, Europe might not be um, uh, appl uh, applicable uh, in, the, in such situations anymore. So we need to look for alternative vaccination strategies by reconsidering territorial coverage, vaccination intervals, national barriers, bait densities, flight line spacing, and cost effectiveness. So another challenge is the prevention of reintroduction uh, of rabies uh, through uh, the non-commercial movement of pet animals from endemic countries. 
So uh, the pet travel scheme that has been implemented for quite a while uh, is actually very effective. However, um, during the past 30 years, there were 30 imported rabies cases uh, re uh, reported uh, due to illegal uh, movement of pet animals from endemic areas. And in one case, and it was France, you know, um, the, um, let's say, um, the uh, intensive uh, epidemiological tracing back and forward could not, uh, could not rule out a further spread of the disease. And so France lost its rabies-free status only to regain it two years later. Incursions and re-incursions of rabies into rabies-free areas are a permanent threat, as has been experienced uh, with raccoon rabies in, in Ontario or in New Brunswick in Canada or with fox, fox rabies in Italy and Greece. So if we have a closer look at the situation in North America, you will see um, that we are here confronted with a multi-reservoir species problem. So Rabies is maintained in a bunch of wildlife reservoir hosts, as you can see here, uh, including foxes, uh, skunks, uh, um, uh, raccoons, um, um, coyotes, and even mongoose. So that is living in a sea of rabies, as my um, uh, um, colleague Richard Shipman from USDA Wildlife Services uh, um, nicely put it. So if you have a closer look at the vaccination strategy currently being imp uh, implemented in North America, you will see that this strategy aims at containment rather than elimination as illustrated here by the control of raccoon rabies in the United States. So the focus here has been directed towards uh, contingency actions to hold the line in order to avoid a further westward spread <coughs> of the um, disease as simulated <coughs> or modeled here in the map on the left-hand side. Bat rabies in <laughs> the Americas is another challenge. Um, uh, variants of rabies virus uh, are circulating in almost all bat species in the Americas. And for reasons unknown, there is a significant um, um, number uh, of spillovers of these rabies virus, bat associated rabies viruses into domestic animals, wildlife, and humans compared to other parts of the world. And these uh, spillovers can get sustained and even result in a host shift, as has been documented uh, for raccoons, red foxes, and skunks in the United States. Host shift events even occur in uh, Europe, uh, but here it's not bad. It's it's not bad, you know. But dogs, as you know, um, as an um, example from Turkey, is illustrating here, because the Turkish authorities were, for reasons unknown, uh, not able to elim eliminate the remaining foci of dog mediated rabies. The virus spilled over into foxes, got established and then spread all over the country. So they actually have created a new problem. So the question is, do we have a multi-species reservoir problem in, in Europe too, as we see it in North America? And the uh, answer is yes, we do. So we have increasing numbers of gray wolves and golden jackals you know, um, you know, regaining lost territories uh, in, the, in the western parts of Europe. Then on the other hand, we have uh, high uh, population densities of alien species so that have been introduced at the beginning of the last century, such as the Asian raccoon dog, North American raccoons, and even Egyptian mongoose on the um, Iberian Peninsula. And Germany is a hotspot for North American raccoons. And in case of an emergency, that say if we get an introduction of rabies, in particular into mongoose and, and um, uh, raccoons here, we are not prepared at all. <coughs> Another challenge is um, um, yeah, the minimum eff effective titer you need uh, to uh, elicit an immune response by the oral route. And it is fairly easy to vaccinate foxes and raccoon dogs, but if it comes to skunks and raccoons, you need a thousandfold higher minimum effective dose to see a similar effect. 
So, and we were interested to see what is, you know, what, what is the problem behind that. And we took um, the fox as an easygoing uh, uh, wildlife rather species and a, f um, a skunks and we are looking at a vaccine uptake uh, post-vaccination. And while in foxes, you can see um, the foci of replicating uh, rabies vaccine virus in the tonsil uh, tissue, which is the target tissue for the vaccine up to four days post-infection, you do, do not see any such foci in skunks and we do not know why. So the bait is a different story. So um, the best vaccine is worth nothing without an attractive bait. So we have already uh, uh, very um, uh, um, eff uh, effective uh, solutions for raccoons and foxes, but the take home message is no, bits, no, no bait fits all species. So we have to develop baits for other reservoir uh, species as well. So once you have got, a, let's say, a good vaccine and a good bait, um, that's so far so good, but if you are unable to deliver the bait to the target species in an optimal way, you are lost again. So um, finding optimal baiting strategies that are maximizing bait delivery to the target species, meanwhile minimizing bait depletion by non-target species is another um, um, a challenge. So we have already optimal bait distribution systems for raccoons and foxes, but not yet for all other uh, wildlife reservoir species. And that, you know, is the take home images is here. These guys go to town, you know, we have increasing numbers of uh, um, or population densities of wildlife rabies reservoir in urban and suburban uh, challenges. And if you think of an optimal baiting strategy, you know, we are competing here actually with the um, um, sheer abundance of anthropogenic food resources and uh, also bait competitors as uh, companion animals. So this is my very last slide. We we'll come to the conclusions. So wildlife rabies cannot be eradicated, that's for sure. But we can eliminate rabies <laughs> in certain wildlife species. And here, oral vaccination is an effective tool, but it will be a long stony and uh, a road and will take decades, if not centuries, to be honest. And there are a multitude of challenges and uh, ahead and problems to be solved. And actually we need more fundamental and applied research and sustained political and financial support from the governments. Thank you so much for your attention.